Hello, everyone. On behalf of the AAW Board of Directors, it's my pleasure to welcome you to another webinar hosted by the American Association for Employment and Education as we continue to support pre-K through 12 educator preparation, recruitment, and retention. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Teacher Temperament, How Understanding Yourself and Others Elevates Job Performance and Engagement. My name is Tim Newbert, and I serve as AAAE's Executive Director. Please allow me to cover just a few housekeeping matters before we begin. This webinar is being recorded and will be made available to AAAE members as well as non-members who registered for the event. Attendees are encouraged to post any questions, comments, or feedback using the Q&A or chat features within Zoom. If you or your organization do not yet have AAAE membership, please visit our website, aaee.org, to learn more about our activities and resources. We are a professional association focused on positively impacting education through professional connections, connecting the three critical groups involved with the preparation, recruitment, and retention of pre-K-12 educators, that being university professionals and others who prepare and support educators, school system professionals and others who recruit, hire, and retain them, and of course, educator candidates themselves. We offer annual publications such as the Job Search Handbook for Educators, we conduct an educator supply and demand survey each fall and winter, resulting in the spring report. We recently conducted a new survey entitled Job Satisfaction Needs of Entry-Level K-12 Educators, Finding the Tipping Points in Cooperation with Youngstown State University. We co-host the careersforeducators.com job board with Kappa Delta Pi. We host webinars such as this one on topics relevant to our membership. We sponsor scholarships for future teachers and many grants for school systems to encourage and support educator pipelines. We co-host an annual national working group on teacher retention in collaboration with Upbeat. And we host an annual conference and education career expo each fall. Our October 2024 event will be held in Denver, Colorado. Joining me for today's webinar is Leanne DeBella, an elementary school teacher and consultant based in California. Thank you for being here with us today, Leanne. We look forward to hearing from you about your knowledge and insights. I'll now turn it over to you. Thank you so much. And thank you to AAAE for hosting this webinar. Thank you to the participants for being here. Um, if you haven't yet and would like to introduce yourself in the chat, please do so. I'm wondering, Mr. Newbert, would you mind copy and pasting the curie.live um, link into the chat? And if that's not possible. Yeah, that... yep. just give me a moment. Sure, thank you. Um, so please wait to click on the link. It'll be uh, after a couple of slides that I'll explain that. So I do want to um, just before I even introduce myself, um, please ask you to take care of yourself. While this is not therapy, it is some psychoeducation and it can be emotionally activating. So I'm just going to trust you to take care of yourself and to please stay, stay open-minded throughout the webinar. Who am I? I do come from a family of teachers. My um, Parents are both retired teachers. My aunts were teachers. My grandmother was a school secretary and uh, my brother swore he never would be a teacher, but he is now teaching at a high school. He teaches video productions. My husband is also a teacher. So I've been an elementary school teacher for 21 years. And during that time, I did earn my master's in counseling psychology at Pacifica Graduate Institute. I, after the pandemic, became concerned when veteran teachers at my school site and new teachers were leaving, um, leaving the profession. So I wanted to contribute to a solution to that problem and have worked this year teaching part-time and then also working on a coaching and consulting practice to mitigate and prevent teacher burnout. So what I told you is who I am, but it's more what I do and where I come from. Who am I really? For each of us, that involves our temperament. Temperament can be defined as the part of your character that affects your moods and the way you behave. I'm borrowing this question, the next question, from an organization called Six Seconds that focuses on emotional intelligence. They asked, what one question should I ask to get to know you? It was actually used as an interview question. 
And I um, now ask it of my fifth grade students at the beginning of the year, every school year. One of the most memorable answers was, don't ask me anything, just observe me. So in answer to that question, I am gonna ask you to contemplate how you would answer the question, what one question should I ask to get to know you? as I tell the story of my answer. My answer would be, ask me what makes me cry, especially as a teacher. And one of my most te memorable teaching um, collection of moments was when I worked with a class on a community problem solving project. They chose the topic healthy living and they developed a project that one component involved them making these fruit bucks out of paper and um, distributing the, them to those who participated in the part of the project where they invited other kids in the school to walk or run a lap around the track. And for each lap, they would earn a fruit buck. And periodically on a Friday, we would have a healthy snack stand. So the kids who had earned fruit bucks could exchange their fruit bucks for healthy snacks. And this was a really exciting time for all the kids. However, one Friday, one of my students came up to me and she looked panicked. Her eyes were big and she was clutching this dark green paper, construction paper. It was about the size of a fruit buck. She handed it to me and said, Miss Hoprich, Miss Hoprich, this is not our fruit buck. And I thought, oh, you're right. It was a counterfeit. It was kind of a poor counterfeit. And she recognized that it wasn't theirs. So I told her I'd need to think a little bit about how to handle that, and I had her go back to the fruit stand. Now, we were, um, I was at the time conferring with a colleague who is now my husband. He was an insurance fraud investigator before he became a teacher. He, as soon as he heard about the problem, said, I'm going to find out who the culprit is. And he did. By the end of that day, a fifth grader came to, oh, I see the comment about the pin and I will give you a pin in just a moment. Thank you so much for your patience. Okay, so I was talking to the fifth grader who counterfeited the fruit, the fruit buck and um, I asked him, why would you do that? He said, well, some of my friends told me that I could never earn any fruit bucks. I couldn't make it even one lap and I wanted to prove them wrong. So we talked about that, and I told him that after having a discussion with my class, they felt like he was making fun of their project, and they were kind of embarrassed and ashamed. He said, no, 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 that's not at all it. He wrote a long apology letter, and um, I asked him to share that with the class. So when he came the next day to my classroom door, he was shaking. He was a big fifth grader and he was just really shaking. And so was the paper in his hand. It was making a lot of noise as he came in and he whispered to me, I'm so nervous. So he read the letter to my students and it was a class that I trusted and knew very well. So I decided to leave one of my students as the leader, and I told them that it was up to them as to the decision about whether or not he could participate anymore. Um, and that was what he wanted to know. And I stepped outside with the boy who had made this counterfeit fruit buck. When I talked to him outside, he was still shaking. He was still nervous. And we entered the classroom. We re-entered. When we did so, I was blown away by my students' responses. The first thing they said to him was, we forgive you. And that usually makes me tear up. After that, they said, you can participate, but it needs to be the right way. And we want you to work this fruit stand with us. Give up your recesses for four recesses and uh, kind of earn your way back in. So he did, and on the last recess, he came up to me before the last recess, he said, I've got a field trip, I forgot, I can't be there at recess, I'm so sorry. I told him it was okay, and then he went ahead and um, earned fruit bucks the legitimate way, and when he traded them for a healthy snack, my class burst into applause. So that was one of my favorite teaching moments. I want you to please think about one question that um, I should ask to get to know you, and once you think about it, I will be giving you the curry pod pin. Curry pod is kind of a new um, 
AI generative um, PowerPoint or slides presentation tool that I like to use. I've just started using with my students. Um, then you'll see a slide where you can put your answer. If you'd prefer to keep it private though, because your answer will um, be displayed. If you prefer to keep it private, um, please feel free to just write your answer down for yourself. Okay, so I'm going to move to the next slide. Um, once you enter your answer, think about who's understood um, most likely in your answer that will reveal some of your values and who's understood that part of you and how does it feel to be understood. Okay, so now if you could, I think you should see a um, see a pin at the top of the screen. The pin is one six five nine three seven so the link um, that mr newber put into the chat curry.live is the one that you'll use if you can have two screens up one with the zoom screen one with the curry.live screen that would be ideal if that doesn't work for you you can just keep the zoom screen up um, or you can go back and forth, there are only three interactive slides that we'll be working on today. If you would prefer to put your response in the chat, that is fine too. So I'm gonna go ahead though and start the timer. I'll check the chat if you're having any trouble and respond there. Um, and I'll give you two minutes to think about and respond to the question, what one question should I ask to get to know you? Oh, I don't like that music, okay. Now you should be able in about three seconds to respond. Oh, peer mediation, that sounds wonderful. Okay, so hopefully you've had some time to think about your question. And you'll have up to two minutes. I might end it a little early if you don't need all that time. When you click the link for curie.live, then it should prompt you to put in a, a code at that point. If you don't see that and you wanna just respond in the chat, that's fine. And um, if you are still writing, if you could finish your thought up, I'm going to end it just a little bit early. So if you could take maybe 10 more seconds to finish your thought. Okay, and I'll end it now. All right, now the responses include, uh, what's your favorite subject? I love that. Do you like math? What, what are you thinking? Oh, I love that question. Social emotional learning is definitely referring to temperament. Yes, I think we're going to touch upon some of that. And who has the greatest impact on your decision to be a teacher? Great question. What brings you joy and why? I love it. What gives you energy every day? Thank you. So um, if you can think about a little bit about the values that are kind of within these questions and reflect on the question that you asked, I'm not going to ask you to provide an answer, um, but reflect on the question you asked as we go through the information and the rest of the presentation, please. Thank you so much for your participation. Some guiding questions for today's work include, how might we bring the best of who we are to the work we do? And how might we employ knowledge of temperament in order to prevent or mitigate burnout? We looked a little bit at what temperament is and now why learn about temperament? Um, I really do believe that the best teacher is the most reflective one. I have seen that. And going even beyond self-reflection, which could include, it's kind of like looking into a pond and seeing yourself and reflecting on that. We can reflect upon our lessons. Maybe we used a gradual release model and we want to modify the independent part because it didn't work as well as we'd hoped. Maybe they needed a little bit more before that. Um, we can reflect upon the work that we're doing. Self-inquiry goes a little bit deeper. It's like diving 
diving into that lake and observing even further. And it's really a lifelong process. Um, there, I think we all want to be self-aware and there is some research in this area that shows that 90, 95% of us believe we are. And the really interesting stat here says psychology consultant Cameron Knott uh, that only 15% actually are. It does take a lot of work to engage in self-inquiry. And I actually view burnout as an invitation to do that kind of work. And that's what I've experienced myself. Um, we will look a little bit at balanced decision making. And at the end of the presentation, I want to give you some practical tools that you can give to the teachers you work with or use yourself as a teacher or use yourself in any position, uh, any role that you carry. Um, Anais Nin said, we do not see things as, the, as they are. We see them as we are. There's also some attention brought to, now instead of the golden rule, um, the platinum rule, treat others how they want to be treated. Understanding ourselves and others allows us to um, have the communication skills that could invite us to treat others the way they wanna be treated. And I add the caveat for the good of all involved. Personality typology theory originates with the work of Swiss psychologist Carl Jung. Myers and Briggs, a mother-daughter team, added to his work and used his body of work to de develop the MBTI, the Myers-Briggs Type indic Indicator Instrument, um, that helps us to understand our personality. In it, we our personality types are divided into 16 different types. And some find this to be rather constricting. Nobody really wants to be put in a box. However, in my experience and observation, um, when used as a tool, the, your Myers-Briggs type can actually be very freeing. I'm going to share with you that when I first went into teaching, I didn't have a whole lot of coping skill tools. So I sought out a, with some help, sought out a therapist who, um, really changed my life. And when it was time for me to exit therapy about 10 years after that, I didn't want to, I wanted to stay with her. I was really getting a lot out of therapy, I thought. But she said to me, you came in thinking you were a terrible extrovert and a horrible sensate. And now you understand that you're an introverted intuitive. I learned who I really am through that self-inquiry work. And it freed me. And it also frees me to understand that everybody else, I, I saw how complex each person is, me included. And so I'm able to interact with others, understanding how complex they are and working to understand myself and others continuously. Um, confidence can be defined as self-trust. And I do think that understanding temperament increases confidence for a lot of people. So let's take a look at the perf personality preference pairs. Think of each of these as a spectrum. So you might fall somewhere on that spectrum. Um, first, where do you get your energy? That was one of the questions that was asked earlier. Where do you get your energy? For people who prefer extroversion, they get their energy from being around others. And um, being alone can really drain them. Whereas those who prefer introversion get their energy from being alone and can be drained when they are forced to be around others. And it's not, when I teach this to my fifth grade students, I always want to make it really clear that it's not that introverts don't like people. They just need alone time to restore their energy. Um, a lot of times uh, it's been said extroverts, people who prefer extroversion might say to themselves, oh, why did I say that? And people who prefer introversion often say to the, themselves, why didn't I say that? Uh, an example of introversion I'm going to share with you is that um, I told you I'm working part-time as a fifth grade teacher this year. My husband was asking how I'm liking the part-time gig. And I said, well, I have these pockets of alone time and I just really love having more alone time. And I saw him kind of tense up and his eyebrows crunched together. And I was like, oh, I think I've been exercising my non-preference of extroversion because I was actually thinking, oh, why did I say that? Why did I say that that way? What I really should have said was, I am enjoying 
brain being able to store up energy during the day so that when I pick my daughter up from school, I have energy for her. And when my husband comes home from work, I have energy for him. So I have more energy for the people who are most important to me in my life. Let's look at the next process, the next pair of preferences, sensing versus intuition. So in the Myers-Briggs, um, in the previous pair, E is for extroversion, I is for introversion. And in this pair, S is for sensing, and then N, since the I was already taken, is for intuition. Um, I did include a picture of a plant here because plants take in information from the sun. They take in uh, information. They take in things from the soil. And we humans take in information all the time as well. And we process it in different ways. Those who prefer the sensing um, function, they like details and facts, and they take in the world through their five senses. Whereas those who prefer intuition, they um, have to kind of depend on their sixth sense, and they are idea people, big idea people, and they're creative. So an example of um, an example of I'm going to tell you a quick story about uh, my intuition preference. I, as a new teacher, roomed with another teacher from our school who actually became the site coordinator at this time. And she got home from school. I was already working on my lesson plans at the table and I was really involved in it. And I heard her say, oh, Luke delivered the chest of drawers. I looked up for my lesson planning and right in front of me was this huge chest of drawers that had not been there before. I hadn't noticed it. And she saw that I was surprised to find in front of me this chest of drawers as though it had just materialized. Um, and she was laughing. And then she added, I'm really extra surprised because you didn't notice that, but you did notice this nonverbal, tiny momentary exchange between the principal and me at our last staff meeting and you asked me about it so she couldn't um, reconcile that I basically we pay attention to what we care about and the information that I cared about was that little exchange not so much the chest of drawers next um, the Decision-making preferences involve thinking and feeling. And of course, thinkers feel and feelers think. So um, some of these words that are used here, I think can be uh, misleading, but when we understand them, it gives us a common language. So uh, thinkers like logic and they make decisions from their minds, whereas feelers make decisions from their hearts um, and they're more emotionally based. So an example um, of the difference between the two actually resides in my previous story. When my husband went into, he, he used his, he gave me permission to share his preferences and he used his thinking preference when he was investigating who made that counterfeit fruit buck. I never would have considered doing that, running an investigation or known how to start that. Um, I used my feeling preference when I was, um, when I was uh, guiding the student who made that counterfeit fruit pack. And another example of using my feeling preference in teaching was that I had a student who had a, a troubled background. She experienced true, true trauma um, in her 10 years more than others that I've known as adults. So I had a lot of compassion for her. And when another student came to me and said um, that the first student had called me a bad name at recess, I wasn't terribly concerned. Um, I didn't take it personally. I'd been teaching long enough that I, I, I know I'm quiet, but I have high expectations for my students and communicate those. And sometimes they're not too happy when I'm strict. Um, so it wasn't the first time. It wouldn't be the last time But I decided that I did want to address it with her. When I pulled her aside, I explained to her that I understand you called me a bad name. It's making your classmates uncomfortable. Let's not do that anymore. But I want to, I want you to know that no matter what you call me, no matter what you even think about me, I will still be there for you. There is nothing so bad that you will push me away. I will be there for you. And she lunged at me with this giant hug, um, 
So that's just an example of I could have gone in a different direction, but my feeling preference motivated the way that I handled the way that I decided to handle that problem. Lastly, we have lifestyle preferences, and that's judging versus perceiving. Um, again, the language here may be a little misleading. Judging doesn't mean being critical. It means here liking things fixed and finalized and planned out. People with the preference for judging feel more comfortable before a decision is made, whereas people per with the preference for perceiving feel more comfortable after a decision is made. They like things open-ended. And I'll give you a quick example of that as well. I have a preference, I think I shared with you my full um, typology as INFJ. So my preference is for judging and I do like things planned out and I spend a lot of time in uh, coming up with, with a plan A and plan B, plan C. So I began to research passion projects. I wanted to do something different with my kids. And passion projects involve the kids driving their, using their curiosity to drive um, their project. They come up with a question uh, related to a topic that they're interested in, and they go ahead and develop a project. Now there are parameters and there are steps, but within this, within the parameters, but there's a lot of open-endedness that made me very uncomfortable. And when I first started it, I really wanted to um, kind of manage every single question. And my students were studying all different things, most of which I had no expertise on. Um, so it was difficult for me to dive in and implement that. However, I did exercise my non-preference of perceiving, and I'm so glad I did. It made me a better teacher. Now, passion project time is my favorite time of the day. I remember sitting with a student next to me and looking up at my classroom. In one corner, there was a student who was molding clay um, chess pieces that were in the shapes of ocean animals that she was using the game to teach about. And then in another corner, there was a student actually walking around interviewing kids about their fears because she wanted to address fears through dance and movement. There was a kid in my back room who was working on testing out a painting. She had studied um, grief and the stages of grief. And so she was going to teach a lesson to younger kids about that. Uh, Passion Project is my favorite time of the day. And again, it's because I exercise my my non-preference that I was able to grow. I like to talk to my students about the, if you think of three concentric circles, the comfort zone, the growth zone, and the um, panic zone. And I also like to be a model of that as well for my students. So when we expand into our growth zone, that then becomes our comfort zone and our growth zone gets larger and our life gets larger. So I think a lot of the work that around typology is to help us live a richer, larger life. Now, temperament um, is complex. Personality is so complex and there are many factors that influence it. Um, working with the 16 personality type is types as a way to almost simplify it, but it's still complicated. So we can simplify it a little further by looking at pairs of, of those types and um, especially at work. So you may encounter, you may identify with one of these um, pairs. You may uh, be able to think of people with whom you work who are fit some of these. Um, I'm just going to kind of go through. I made up the acronym, but the research is typology work. So I have heard of an analogy that I like to use, especially with my students as well, um, of thinking of a stall of horses. And in the first stall are our intuitive feelers. You can think of them as unicorns. They like to fit in, but sometimes they're horn shows because they are kind of original thinkers and they're in the minority of the population. So so are, so are intuitive thinkers. So intuitive feelers, I use the acronym CARES, they like to communicate appreciation and they like for appreciation to be communicated to them. Being authentic is really important to them as well. And being responsive to the interpersonal, empathetic, they like to search for meaning. Um, intuitive 
thinkers, NTs, you can think of as like a Pegasus that flies over and takes in the big picture. Um, I use the acronym FLIGHT for that reason. And they are focused on possibility. They're a little picky about who they want to spend their time with. Um, sometimes they're seen as rule breakers, but really they're always looking for how to improve upon what's already being done. They see life as a system to be designed and redesigned, and they're ignited by ideas. They're very good at starting projects and sometimes can have some trouble finishing them. Um, they're hungry for competence. One of the biggest thorns in a NT's side could be uh, working for a leader who they don't feel is competent. Um, they have a tough time noticing the feelings of others, so sometimes that needs to be explicit with them. In the next stall of horses would be our sensate judgers, and you can think of them as the pack horses. They are the people who get things done in the world. They want to belong and contribute. They are orderly and dependable. They're realistic. They know and understand values of an institution, and they want to support those values. They are stable, they are stable and structured, and they want, um, to, they want others to be stable and structured as well. The SP, Sensate Perceivers, I uh, use the acronym PLAYS. They're a lot of fun. They're like uh, bunky, bucking broncos. Um, they plan short range projects and that's a real strength of theirs. They like the freedom. They like freedom and action. They are always willing to negotiate and no matter what age they are, they seem youthful, especially in their risk-taking behavior. They can be seen as indecisive at times. I talked a little bit about stretching to our non-preferences. And um, I wanna tell you a quick story about a student of mine who came to me. I have my kids sign up for passion project meetings when they think they're ready or if they have the questions. So she thought she was ready to move on to the next step. I sat with her and it was a great opportunity for me to guide her into using some of her non-preferences. Her passion project was about war. She thought she thinks that kids should learn about war earlier. And she, um, for the reason that she doesn't want mistakes to be repeated. So she interviewed a college professor, took extensive notes, and basically wrote an informational essay. She did a good job with that, but I wanted her to use some of her non preferences and encourage those um, in her audience to as well. So she ended up with some guiding questions, creating, uh, punctuating the informational report that she wrote with questions. And some of them ended up being using some figurative language, which was a stretch for her and she was excited by it. And she ended up putting some of those questions onto a spinning wheel. She wanted um, to open conversation between kids and their parents. So she punctuated her work with these questions and she um, kind of used some perceiver function to add a little, um, unpredictability to it. She is so proud of the work that she's done and I'm so proud of her. Okay, so um, along those lines, I'd like you to think about what stretches you and if you could go back to your Curie Live window or tab. Um, you'll need it for this activity and the next activity. I did not explain word clouds when I talked to my students. And it was kind of funny to me because a lot of times I'm trying to get them right to write complete sentences. But for the word cloud, they wrote complete sentences. And I really wanted them just to write one word or a phrase. Um, so for this activity, you can write up to three words or phrases. Please take a moment. Just think about what stretches you. Um, some examples, public speaking, spontaneity, navigating uncertainty. You can think about the work we were just doing and um, what would stretch you for my student. Some of those things I just said, navigating uncertainty might, might work. Uh, you'll have about a minute and 30 seconds, maybe a little bit less to respond. And again, this is on the screen that, has, that you put the code into, curie.live. Uh, if you have a question, I'll be monitoring the chat. And uh, here you go. It should start in about three seconds.
Okay, and I'm going to stop it in about 10 seconds. Okay, and I'll show the word cloud. Thank you so much for your participation. All right, so the question, uh, the responses were deadlines. Thank you. Empathy, rushing, the lack of a deadline, understanding each other's experience, difficult physical exercise, alternative solutions, clear communication, meet and greet. Oh, I had one professional development where our name tags were moved at each break. So throughout the day, we had like, we were at five different tables and that was a tough one for me. All right. Thank you so much for your participation. Again, I'm going to move on to the next question question, which is what stresses you? So um, maybe it's negativity, maybe it's noise. Think for a moment about what stresses you, and I'll ask you to respond again with up to three responses, words, or phrases in the Curie Live window. Oh, and thank you. We've got some stretches that were recorded in the code, in the chat, sorry. Okay, here comes the Curie Live. What stresses you word cloud activity? And I'm going to end this one in about 10 seconds. Okay, and to back up for a moment in the chat, we have some stretches, someone snapping at me, metronome sounds, I understand that, I can relate, someone acting like a general in the military, that makes me think of a picture book, the Arab bullies the life on Liberty Street, something like that. Okay, so conflict was clearly the, the biggest thing that stresses us as, a, as an audience here. We also have live recordings, unclear expectations, ignorance, student behavior, rest on the corner room. I'd be curious about that. Um, and working alone or working with people, okay. Prioritizing projects, lack of time, mental health needs. Thank you so much for your participation. When we look at stretches and stresses, I like to emphasize that um, our stretches oftentimes come from our conscious choice to use our non-preferences of our temperament. However, I'm sorry, that's our stretch, stress stretches. Our stresses come when we're forced to use our non-preferences. Um, so some stress, and I like to explain this to my students too, some stress is okay. Some stress um, can create change. A little bit of stress can help us if we manage conflict in an appropriate way, create closer connections. So some stress is okay. However, prolonged stress, that can be detrimental. And I'd like to talk a little bit about burnout now. Burnout is defined by Christina Maslach, a pioneer of burnout research, as an imbalance. And I love that, an imbalance. It kind of feels hopeful to me in that you can balance things out again at the individual, interpersonal, and institutional levels that include psychological and physical repercussions. Maslach is careful to... Um, emphasize that it is not the worker's fault if they're burnt out, that there are systemic imbalances, paths that lead to uh, burnout. And any one of the paths she talks about could lead to burnout. That's kind of for a whole different webinar. Um, but I see with teachers, a lot of times if there's a mismatch between their values and the action values of the organization that can create burnout alone. So prolonged stress, she talks about burnout as sort of a rock in the shoe. It's something that is not just 
um, certain times in the year, certain months are a little more stressful than for teachers than others. So this is burnout is really continuous. And there are hallmarks of burnout that you can look out for in yourself and in others and those you lead. Emotional exhaustion is one. Research shows that women um, experience or embody more emotional exhaustion than men. I wonder, based on experience and observation and not scientific research, I wonder if um, those who have a preference for feeling experience more emotional exhaustion, that's what I've noticed. I've also noticed that those who have more of a preference for thinking exhibit the signs of cynicism or apathy. Um, and research shows that it's more men than women who exhibit apathy. However, I was working with a teacher who is, ha has a preference for thinking. And she said to me, I don't have burnout. I'm not burned out. I just don't care anymore. But really that apathy is a sign of burnout and a sense of inefficacy. We get into this, we get into education to make a difference. And when you start feeling like well, your work doesn't matter, that is kind of a, a red flag. I put a picture here of fireweed flower. So this is taken in Alaska and fireweed flower is the first growth after an area that's been burned. I think it's a good metaphor because it shows that even though there, there's destruction here, there's also creation. And I like to look at any internal conflict as an opportunity for growth, an opportunity to further yourself on that path of self-inquiry. And for me, burnout was just that. And I feel like I was blessed by burnout, by overcoming it. And it did help me to continue my self-work. So the opposite of burnout is job engagement. And that's what we're seeking. And the qualities of job engagement are the opposite of the hallmarks of burnout. So we have energy, involvement, and a sense of efficacy. I'll let you just take a moment to read these two questions and reflect on them. Okay, understanding temperament to temper burnout how stress can lead to an explosion of our natural typology, like an extinction burst demonstrated by a student can help us, understanding this can help us to be proactive about it. So if you think of your temperament as sort of the house and that's what's showing and that's where you live, but you still have a basement, we all embody every you know, both all both sides of the pairs, just it's sort of like being left-handed or right-handed. We prefer one over the other. It doesn't mean we can't use the other. Um, and we talked about how using the non-preference does stretch us. When we are forced to use our non-preferences, um, that's where we might experience more stress. And then we kind of turn to, we kind of increase the intensity on our natural typology. So we go to the extremes of our personality. And um, for example, somebody who prefers introversion under stress may even further um, isolate themselves. And so it's sort of like an extinction burst demonstrated by a student. When we have a, a student whose behavior we want to extinguish, if it is a attention seeking behavior, we ignore it. So it's gonna get worse most likely before it gets better. And at the very worst, it's called the extinction burst and then it improves. So when we're experiencing one level of stress, we are going to what's worked for us before in our personality and our temperament, but to the extreme. Now, the next, another level of stress may, though, cause the emergence of our basement type. Our basement type is our opposite type. I told you I am an INFJ. Those are my letters with Myers-Briggs. The basement type would be the opposite. So for me, that would be E, extroverted, um, S, sensate, T, thinking, and P, perception, perceiving. So there are times when you or somebody you know might not really be acting like themselves. That could be an indication that they're under a great amount of stress. I know when I was under a huge amount of stress at school and at home, um, I started yelling at my dog and I'm not a yeller. So I'd be like, whose voice is coming out of my mouth? But it was those parts of myself that are kind of a little more buried. I find that the more we stretch ourselves and exercise our non-preferences, the less likely we are to be taken by surprise by our basement type. 
So stress does occur. One, one way that stress occurs is when we are forced to use our non-preferences. And you can just consider the question, how do you re react to stress and how might that affect your leadership style? And I'd like to share with you um, as we finish up a practical tool that you can use called the decision-making Z model and share with those you lead. In, as a teacher, we make so many decisions in isolation every day. That alone is stressful and exhausting. Um, this model isn't for every decision a teacher is going to make. There are some that you have to make on the fly, but sometimes we feel like we have to make decisions right away, but we can take a minute to analyze them a little bit further. So this model is for that kind of situation where you can take a little time with it. I'm going to go through the decision-making Z model using an example from my teaching experience with a, um, with a parent who was notorious at our school. I remember it was four days into the school year and I got an email and her name was on it. And I thought, oh, what is this? I opened it up and it said, I have a slight concern that I'd like to discuss with you. Now, um, I right away reacted defensively. I was like, oh my gosh, it's only been four days. Why can't this lady give me some time to develop a relationship with her child? This isn't long enough. I'd be embarrassed to send out an email like this four days into school. I was being, you know, kind of judgmental and very defensive. And those are clues to me that I need to step back and kind of look at myself a little bit. Um, so when I did step back and took away the emotion of the situation for me and worked on this decision-making model, I first described the problem to myself. You can write this down, um, write down your description of the problem and gather the facts. So for, for me in this situation, that was, it was four days into the new school year. The email said she had a slight concern. There was no indication of what that concern was. So from there, I moved on to step two, which is use your imagination to consider new possibilities. And that's using the intuition um, preference. So for step one, I was working on my non-preference. For you, it might be a preference. For step two, I was working on working with my preference. And at the time I was studying um, the work of relationship expert, experts, a uh, husband and wife team, the Gottmans, and they coined the phrase bid for connection. So a bid for connection is when in a romantic relationship, one partner says something or maybe even just sighs, and then the other partner can respond in several different ways. So if partner one sighs, <sighs> partner two may turn toward partner one and say, um, what's wrong? Are you okay? You sound like, like something's not going well. Or they could turn away from partner one, and that would just basically be ignoring the comment or the sigh. They might continue to play on their phone, but they're just ignoring it. Sec uh, third choice could be that they turn against their partner, and a turn against would be like, what is wrong now? So they're getting kind of aggravated and uh, more on the aggressive side. Um, the studies that the Gottmans have conducted have shown by quite a degree that those partners who more frequently turn toward each other during bids for connection have longer lasting relationships. And I think the quality is, is shown to be better as well. So um, for my situation, it wasn't involving a romantic relationship, but I wondered um, using my using some creativity, could I apply this model to reframe the situation for myself? I thought maybe I could look at this mom's um, outreach as a bid for connection. And maybe even though it is the fourth day of school, maybe that's a good thing. Maybe we can establish now a healthy relationship that will take us throughout the school year. So just by reframing it, I was starting to apply a new way of thinking, a new possible solution. 
Um, I also thought about how I encourage my students and need to model this myself more to express as an introvert, as somebody who with an introverted preference, um, I like to take my time with things. I like to take things in, metabolize them, and then come out with uh, what I've thought about. I like to do that thinking internally. Extroverts like to think out loud. Um, so I decided that if I needed to, once I was apprised of the situation, I could express my need to spend more time thinking about it and get back to her. I then moved on to step three, analyze logically the pros and cons of each possibility. And that's using the thinking prep. For me, the thinking is a non-preference. So that really did stretch me. I was looking at how um, possible outcomes could include open, clear co communication, um, maybe a stronger relationship throughout the year. Um, a possible out could, could, outcome could be that maybe she is mad at me. Maybe she goes to the district as she had been known to do um, against teachers. So I just kind of, again, and took away any feelings that were entwined with that and looked logically at what the possibilities were. Finally, I went on to step four using the feeling function, consider the values and the impact on the people involved. And I thought if I employed this turning toward strategy and viewing her concern as a bit for connection, that um, I might be able to show her that I'm an ally to her, that I'm an ally to her child and anybody else involved in the situation. Um, also for me, if I decide ahead of time that I could communicate that I might need more time to think about the situation and come back to her, that might make me less nervous. I also decided that acting quickly now that I'd had a plan would be important for making me less nervous. So in the end, I, I did uh, address it as a bid for connection. I spoke with um, this mom and it turned out that at lunchtime where teachers are not in my school, it's uh, student time, they're supervised by aides. Um, my student had some sushi and another student said, oh, that's gross. And so that was the concern. And I guess the bigger concern was that the mom's child was now saying, I want peanut butter and jelly. I want to fit in. And so I was able to, I did say to mom that I, I needed a little more time to think about the situation and how I would handle it, um, but that it was not a, an unsolvable problem and something that we could work on and that each party could grow from. Um, and so it ended with mom saying to me, I respect that. I respect you. And we've had a really strong relationship. And I think it started with this. Okay, a couple other um, practical tips that can be implemented pretty quickly I'm going to share with you now. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for hanging in there. Um, I did sort of an experiment where I listed every task that I had as a teacher during the day. And then I classified each task into typological terms. So this is not scientifically based again. However, I did see some research recently that supported, um, supported the, work, the experiment that I did here. So if teaching itself were a person, I think it would be an ESFJ extroverted, sensate, feeling, judging. The tasks that I have to do as a teacher, the majority of them fall into that, that kind of category. So I am not saying that only ESFJs make extraordinary teachers. Any personality type can make an extraordinary teacher, especially if that person is self-reflective. The reason that I'm sharing this experiment with you is that if you or those you lead have different preferences than E or S or F or J, that may be a place in teaching that they're called upon to stretch. And it could create stress if it's not, you know, if it's forced um, as I think we can all agree that teaching does involve extroverting quite a bit. And so for introverts, for those who prefer introversion, that's something that you want to create a plan for. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a moment. Secondly, um, use an accurate tool for identifying your own typology. If you're open to it and interested in taking the Myers-Briggs and haven't before, I would certainly uh, recommend that. I can give you some guidance as to um, different possibilities, paths for identifying your own typo typology. You're welcome to reach out to me, send me an email. I'll show you my email address in just a minute. Um, 
as a teacher, I like, I like free stuff. I use CuriPod. That was free. It's excellent actually with kids. Um, and I try not to spend a ton of my own money if I can help it. However, when it comes to my own self-care, I, that's a place where I don't skimp. There are lots of personality tests out there. Some are not so great. Some are great. Um, please reach out if you would like some help to some guidance in finding one that, that fits your needs. Um, third, try the Z model that I just showed you. Fourth, um, typology goal setting. And by that, I mean, look at your stressors. It's more of like a st stress management um, plan. So if you or somebody you lead is has an introversion preference as a teacher, you've got to be more extroverted. I made a plan that in the morning I would take five minutes for breathing techniques, and then I would go ahead and um, I save that space um, and just by myself, take that time before the students come in. Then at lunch, I read while I have my lunch. I've communicated with my colleagues that I need that time to re-energize. And then after school, I try to, I need to do this a little more, take time to just listen to a song by myself and have some quiet time. Um, so those are three places within the day that I'm building in some introversion time to re-energize. Automatic writing is a tool where you write a question to yourself uh, with your dominant hand and then take a moment to breathe and relax and then respond with your non-dominant hand. A question that I suggest you start with is this one, the miracle question. Suppose tonight while you slept, a miracle occurred. When you awake tomorrow, what would be some of the things that you would notice that would tell you life had suddenly gotten better? So again, you can write that with your dominant hand, take a moment and then let the response come out of your non-dominant hand. It'll look like a three-year-old wrote it, but that's part of the beauty of it. Um, and then sometimes that'll spur on another question that you can write with your dominant hand, respond with your non-dominant hand and just see what wisdom within you comes out. Then building and activating a support system is um, something that I think becomes a little easier with the tools of typology. So you don't have to use the language, but you can use the ideas from it and, and say to family or friends that, you know, I'm feeling a lot of stress, here's why, and can, you know, can I call on you? So just to be conscious about activating a support system can be helpful. Um, lastly, communicating your preferences and needs effectively, including that which makes you feel valued. So sometimes if, you're, um, if your leader has a different preference than you, you might consider asking for appreciation in the way that you prefer. Like, I don't like to stand up in a crowd and be recognized, but I love getting an email saying uh, specifically what I'm doing that's appreciated. That means so much to me. So we have different preferences and knowing ourselves, knowing those preferences can help us communicate them to others. Um, I don't often allow adults in my classroom because of my extreme uh, preference for introversion, but I kind of broke that rule and had an intern come for a couple of months. At the end of his, our time together, he said to me, oh, I hope your students are listening because what you're teaching them is how to be in a relationship. And really our career is relationship rife. We create relationships with our students, with our colleagues, with our leaders, with our mentors, uh, with the parents. And uh, knowing this information about typology, I find really allows for a richer work life um, and helps us to combat burnout, to increase job engagement immensely. So a couple of resources for you, and I apologize, this is not clickable, but you could search the center part of any of these addresses to find the information. Six Seconds is an organization that um, is related to emotional intelligence. People Stripes is typology based, but it's geared more for families and for kids. Um, Creative Mind Life and specifically the podcast they put out called Soul Sessions is very um, good if you're interested in the idea of self-inquiry. It takes Jungian concepts and delves much deeper into those. And then the Myersbriggs.com is uh, has some podcasts that I, if you're interested in this, you might find um, to be really engaging. 
Okay. And if you have any questions or you would like some guidance in terms of the route to take to find out your personality personality type, please feel free to contact me at leandabella17 at gmail.com. Uh, and also your feedback is so valuable to me. If you're willing, I know I got a late start and I apologize. And I thank you for hanging in there with me. If you're willing to take a few more minutes to fill out a five question survey, I'd appreciate it. I will try to drop that into the chat right now. And I want to thank you so much for all of your time and um, I, it's an honor to be part of your journey of um, self-reflection and self-inquiry. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Leanne. Um, I actually I did post into the chat the uh, the link to your survey uh, for this uh, post session. So thank you so much. Uh, very fascinating uh, presentation and and uh, lots lots there to think about for all of us. So uh, we appreciate you and uh, thank you attendees for uh, joining us and for being patient with us today. Um, and the recording of this session uh, has been made and will be available to you uh, hopefully tomorrow and you will be notified when that's available. Thanks a lot, Leanne, appreciate you. Thank you, thank you so much. And thank you to the AAEE, take care. Thank you. Absolutely, take care. <laughs>